This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm David McDonald. I'm Sam Mercier's. And this week we're happy to have our friends, uh, saxophonist Jeff Leffert and composer Matt Shandorf, on the show today. Thanks for being on the show, guys. Thanks for having it's us. It's a pleasure. Yes. Thanks. Both, both friends and hashtag friends of the show, because you've both been on here before, but never together. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, uh, Jeff's new album, released earlier this year, includes Matt's Differential Moods, uh, which is actually the title of the album as well. Um, we'll be listening to a clip of that piece later on in the show. Um, but actually, Jeff, I wanted to ask you, um, so the H2 Quartet, of which you are a member, performed recently at the Queen's New Music Festival. And I take it you were able to make it to that performance because you were delayed about, what, 20 hours or something? Well, it was unfortunate. <laughs> um, you know, we live close by, but in this particular instance, we traveled from three different airports, so Tulsa, Oklahoma City, and Wichita. Um, and Jeff and Jonathan made it fine, but Kim and I, um, our flight uh, was canceled um, before we could make our connection, so we were stuck in St. Louis and then Chicago, um, and then we went into another New York airport. So after it was about 22 hours, is correct, we, we made it, and um, we had a great time at the Queens New Music Festival, so I'm glad that we did make it. Um, but I think we are in New York for less time than the travel, aggregate <laughs> travel. Does, so. yeah, yeah, that's I, how it goes. <laughs> I didn't know exactly what happened, but I remember when that was going down, having a thought in my head, man, that sucks for Jeff and Kim. I didn't like pay exact attention, but I kept seeing these posts about our flight was canceled, we're still stuck here, blah, 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 whatever, you know. Huh. Well, I was but, with the other guys, and they were just kind of like giving me updates by text message. Oh, nope, delayed another three hours. Here's another three hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it was, um, you know, I, that just happens with air travel. And um, I don't know. I think New York's airports have been busy with air traffic. But we made it. I guess that was the important thing. I was a little bit nervous for a time. Um, but we had a great time at the festival, absolutely. And any time we can get to New York, is, um, it's something we really value and look forward to. So, Jeff, um Obviously, uh, we, everybody on the panel is familiar with H2, and we've listened to all your recordings and some of his written pieces for you. But you have a solo release out now, um, which is not surprising. A, a good saxophone player who's got a teaching position, it, A, wants to, and B, is sort of obliged to do, do, do such a thing. Um, tell us about what gave you the idea and how you picked the composers and all that stuff. Like, How, you, how did you come up with your new album? Sure. Well, the CD, and I have a copy here um, titled Differential Moods, which is after Matt's piece. Um, um, it's about collaboration, I think, foremost, um, and, and really on many different levels. Um, um, you know, I, it's really been a privilege to be able to play the saxophone and, um, and pursue music as a career. And I've had a lot of help, um, and, um, you know, I, I just can't say enough about the people I went to school with, especially. Um, so both the composers and the performers. You had mentioned the H2 Quartet, um, and I could speak all day about those guys, Jeff Dybul and Jonathan Nickel and uh, Kim Lefford, um, um, who's very special to me, obviously. We're married. <laughs> um, she's okay. Um, she's all right. But, you know, all of them are on this. Just all right. she's, all right. she's better than us. She's the best Lefford between the two of us. Um, <laughs> But uh, all, all three of them are on this disc, um, so it featured um, the quartet, but not in quartet pieces, so either in duos or trios. Um, also, um, good friends of mine, Johnny Salinas, who's an excellent saxophonist. Um, my teacher and mentor, Joseph Luloff, is on this disc. His son, jo uh, Jordan Luloff, um, performs with us as well. And um, David Dees from Texas Tech University. Um, also, Mary Fukushima, who... Um, um, we play in a flute saxophone duo together, and she's wonderful. Um, and the Jun Okada, who's one of the best club yes. pianists around. Um, so from a performance standpoint, that was something really special to me. But the music, um, I'm really proud of the music on this disc. And, um, you know, I can't say enough about the people that I've had an opportunity to work with. And Matt Shandorf, um, you know, his, his work as a title track um, was a great uh, friend and um, really co colleague of mine um, throughout graduate school. And um, it's an excellent piece. And, and, you know, one thing I really admire about Matt is, you know, he writes in his own style and, and he won't let anybody tell him 
you know, this is what it needs to sound like. And um, it's really, there's a lot of depth in this music. It's accessible. Um, um, and I perform that piece quite a bit, but it's a good one. Um, you know, some other ones like Igor Kadachev, um, he's an excellent composer. He's a Bosnian composer. He's on the faculty with me here at Oklahoma State University. Um, and he does a little bit of everything, electronic music. He's a jazz pianist. Um, you know, he's full professor at the Sarajevo Music Academy concurrently with his responsibilities here at Oklahoma State, um, which is impressive. And, um, you know, he never really brags about himself. Um, um, I, I could just go down the line. I'm, I'm really proud of, of all these works and the composers on it. I think it's a great disc because of the music. Yeah. Well, personally, uh, I'd like to give a shout out to Juna Kata. I mean, everybody on the panel has heard her play a lot. And, you know, she plays... It, it can't be overstated that she is so good, and the literature she has to have at her fingertips is modern saxophone literature, which ain't like accompanying a violinist, you know. Sorry, but, you know, it's just, that's that's a hard gig, and she does a fantastic job of it. Yeah, she's great, and I mean, she's really quite famous among saxophone circles. Yes. That literature is difficult yeah. to tackle, and it's stylistically challenging, technically challenging, and... Um, right. She's all over it. So I mean, that was a pleasure to collaborate with her. I think among the easiest things to record, actually, in part um, because of her professionalism and just her musicianship. Absolutely. And her work is pre preserved for uh, posterity on Joe Luloff's uh, electronic piano thing. Well, I don't know what it's called. His, his electronic player piano uh -huh. has, right. has Junicata uh, saved in clavier. it permanently. Yeah. Huh, wow. So he can... So he can rehearse all the the standard monster pieces, you know, without having to fly her to Lansing. I, you um, know, I I'm curious how many of these works are the first recording of these works because I think that's a really yeah. valuable thing, not just for us that like listening to music, but also I would think for you as an educator to have a lot of these works recorded for the first time. Sure. Well, most of them are. Um, in fact, a lot of this disc um, was. Most of the disc, either I premiered the piece or I've worked closely with the composer in some capacity. And I think that's part of what makes it special for me um, is, you know, I, I've had a lot of help. And, and I think it's mostly in terms of ideas and that, that I've been able to share with um, my peers, such as Matt. Um, you know, Dave McDonald, for instance, and we, we recorded a saxophone quartet by him. It's an excellent work, um, <laughs> Falling Up the Down Escalator. Um, but, you know, the, the Mark Mellitz, Farfalli Cota, that's the first saxophone recording of that. Um, I believe that work was for two ocarinas originally. Um, and I'm not sure that... Really? It was yeah. Um, I had no idea. And it, and it works that for the timbre, the saxophone. Yeah, um, I've heard you guys beat. play that a bunch of times. And, and you know, it's it's a nice piece. I mean, I, I really respect Mark's music a lot. I mean, this, it you know, I, I really do. I mean, so we've been doing a lot with the quartet. Um, David Rakowski's work... Um, was composed for um, Mary Fukushima and me. Um, and I mean, Dave Rakowski is uh, top-notch in every way. He's brilliant. And um, we're really proud to have a piece by him. And, and I think this is um, among the best of that combination that exists. Um, the Christian Lobus stuff, um, these are not um, the first recordings. However, I, I worked with Christian Loba and also Francois Rosset. There's four works uh, by him on this disc, um, a couple of which are the first recording. Um, those two guys, Francois and Christian, um, um, I did my um, graduate study work on them. So for the lecture recitals, it was Loba and Rosé, um, both um, composers who reside in Bordeaux. Um, and I can't say enough about what they've done for the saxophone. So I'm proud to have those works on there. Um, Matt Shandorf, and we went to school together and uh, played multiple pieces by him, a quartet um, called Fibonacci's Rabbits that uh, <laughs> included me hopping around the stage on a bass saxophone. Um, it's a great work, and, I mean, he's, he's excellent. Um, Igor Karachev talked about him, a colleague of mine. Um, those were two works that were um, composed for me and premiered by me. Um, and Ben Furman's on this disc as well, and uh, Ben's a good friend of ours. Um, from Michigan State University, um, really, I think, a brilliant guy, and, um, um, and and I'm really proud to have his music on this disc as well. So, uh, One of the, of the regular disc, producers uh, and hosts of uh, Patchian on the Sound Notion Podcast Network, huh. Ben Furman. Cool. The house ad for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, uh, Matt, can you tell us a yes. little bit about uh, Differential Moods, actually, the, the title piece of this album? Uh, well, it originally was a piece for oboe and piano, um, 
but I think it works a lot better for uh, for soprano sax. Um, so I I rewrote it for Jeff for soprano sax, um, and and well I <laughs> I was right. It works really really well for soprano sax, and he just he played the heck out of it. Um, it was originally written back in '07. Uh, rewritten in, uh, Jeff, do you remember? Was it like 08, 09, something like that? I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think around 09. Yeah, it, it, uh, it originally uh, came about because I had been wanting to write a solo piece for Jeff for a long, long time. Um, the original idea was it was going to be a piece for uh, unaccompanied Barry Sachs, which um, one of these days I still plan on doing, Jeff. I still want to write that piece. I just... <laughs> <laughs> I haven't quite gotten to that point yet, but in the meantime, um, I had this other piece, Differential Moods, uh, that I thought um, would really lent uh, itself well stylistically to what the soprano sax could do. Um, Read. It, yeah, it, and it just it, it 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 came off really well, and 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 Jeff and June just they play the heck out of it, and it's it's not an easy piece, but they make it sound easy. It's, yeah, I, I'm, I'm quite impressed. Well, it makes sense to me if you were thinking uh, oboe when you wrote it, the sort of the, the difficulties that the player might experience, I think, are real similar for soprano sax and oboe. Like if you say, I want a low B natural here and I want it really, really quiet. Well, that's mm. going to stress an oboe player out. It's also going to stress a soprano sax player out. Oh, yeah. 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 Um. So yeah, that's. Uh, I was wondering real quick, Jeff. I wanted to get back to something that is a, of, a, of really interesting to me. Uh, Christian and I. You said his name, and I was trying to memorize how to say it correctly. Loba. Yeah, Loba is correct. Loba. Okay, I'd heard it said Lauba and other variations of that vowel sound. He is a peculiar composer, somewhat. Uh, and I wonder if you could just give us like a real quick. Uh, you know, overview. I, I'm assuming you know lots about the guy since you did graduate work on him. So he's an interesting person, and how he came up with these etudes, which are now considered, I think, pretty standard for for advanced saxophonists. I would say, right? Absolutely. And um, you know, Christian's brilliant. And when I think about composers who've really changed the direction of how the saxophones played, Christian's certainly one of them. Um, um, he's, he's really an interesting person. He was not. Um, he didn't do anything with music until I believe it was the age of 29. Um, yes. And, and a, fr a friend of his noticed he had a good ear and kind of forced him to go to the conservatory. Um, prior to that, Christian was a linguist. Um, he studied languages and he speaks five languages fluently, which is impressive. Um, he's French, but um, he's from Tunisian descent. Um, and what he says is, you know, since he didn't start music training until he was basically 30 years old, um, and he wasn't, um, you know, necessarily always listening to European music. I mean, I, I know that he said his parents were listening to North African music often. Um, he, he always says that he wasn't conditioned to hear music um, a certain way, and I think that's really quite profound because most of us are, and we listen to Western music when from an early age, um, and we go through musical training, um, and so we have certain concepts and ideas of what music should be like. Um, Christian doesn't necessarily have that, and so you find in his music a lot of references to pop culture or um, there's African influences, um, really quite a lot, and so he's fascinating. He's, he's really quite a good pianist as well, um, um, but in I believe uh, the mid '90s, um, he was um, um, became um, acquainted with Jean-Marie Landex and his saxophone studio at the Conservatory in Bordeaux, um, and he started writing uh, these etudes for Jean-Marie Landex and and his students there. Um, and um, it really demands that the saxophonist um, play the saxophone in a different way. So yeah. Um, Utilize the multiphonics and slap tongue and circular breathing and a lot of that stuff. Um, though you know we've seen it and works prior to that, um, it wasn't as commonplace. I, I think Christian really championed um, the saxophone and looking for <laughs> techniques that were idiomatic to the saxophone. So in other words, you know the saxophone did have a lot of music, of course, but so much of it um, could have been played by anything. And so 
Christian's music made the saxophone special because really only a saxophonist could play so much of it. Um, and so he's a brilliant composer. And those two works on the disc, Taj, um, which um, is short for former Tajikistan, um, or for Tajikistan and the former Soviet Union. Um, it, it really has this sort of Arabic sound to it. Um, and then ours is reflective of ours Nova. Um, and they're really very different pieces, but he's brilliant. And I, I can't say enough great things about Christian Lobo. Yeah, well, I actually learned about him, I think, from Jeff Dibel, another H2 Quartet member, originally. Um, and it's just, it, to me, it's so striking that someone who didn't come to, you know, academically come to music until so, so late in life and now has had such a profound impact on the way an instrument that he didn't play <laughs> is thought of and used in the kinds of techniques that I think I think it's had a big impact on, like, you. You graduated with a DMA in performance, and I expect you to be able to do certain things because of that. A lot of what I expect out of you is based off of what he did, I think. Sure. You know, and um, I'm sure this is the case for all instruments, but certainly with the saxophone, um, the composers of the last um, few decades, I mean, have really determined the direction of the instrument and what we're expected to do. And, you know, it's, it's strange. I remember um, when I was starting college and at the end of high school, um, this is when I first um, um, became acquainted with this music, circular breathing and slap tongue. And um, it seemed so challenging back then. And it was like the cutting edge of what we do. And now, I mean, my high school students all do it and almost as well as I do in most <laughs> Cases. I mean, it just um, it's just absolutely changed the expectation um, technically um, for what this, a saxophone is should be able to do. And absolutely. Um, it's you know to tackle this music, it, it really requires a lot. And um, I think collectively as saxophones, we're grateful to the composers for this. It's um, they've really pushed us, and and I know that's the case um, um, for for other instruments. But it, it's really it's very apparent for us, and the saxophone is it. Um, because we arrived so late to the scene, I feel like everything's been compressed, and um, yeah. it's it's like a microcosm of the history of some the development of some other instruments, at least yes. from a technical standpoint. So, yeah, I completely agree. And you basically don't have nine hundred pounds of baggage that you have to drag behind you uh, to, to in order to get to the new pieces. So I think that's why saxophone is so ripe for development that way. Yeah, and you know, it's one thing uh, it's, I do a lot with saxophone quartet, obviously, and I, I love playing in the quartet, and I love collaborating um, with the guys in the H2 quartet, but also with composers. I mean, it's a big part of what we do. Um, and I would imagine um, for composers, in a way, it could be exciting to write for the saxophone quartet. When you write for strings, um, I mean, the string quartets have such a, a, a long and um, and wonderful history of music. But when you write for strings, and you consider what Haydn's done for the string quartet, um, and what Beethoven's done and um, you know what Ravel and Debussy did and what Bartok did and Shostakovich um, you know and those are all great pieces Ligeti um, but when you write for the saxophone quartet there's really no such history I mean it's it's a handful of pieces and we do have a few good ones uh, but mostly very late um, mm -hmm. you know all, all 20th century I mean we, we have only a handful of 19th century works for the quartet um, and most of them haven't been expanded um, to where they're really serious work. So um, that's one of the things that I, I would find, I think the composers find exciting for writing for the saxophone quartet is you can immediately um, kind of put your um, voice in the direction of, the, of this ensemble. Right. I'm wondering what the collaborative process was like getting ready for this album with the people who were across the pond. Right. <laughs> It was it was challenging and it took a long time. Uh, now, fortunately, I've played with so many of these people um, a while. I mean, the quartet guys and Johnny Salinas, um, we performed together a lot. Um, with Mary, um, you know, we were a new ensemble, but we had been performing quite a bit. It was just a matter. It was a challenge logistically because we recorded the whole disc in the same space in Michigan. And um, and I started recording this in 2011. Um, and it, we, the release date wasn't until the very start of 2014. Um, so, you know, it took some time um, to get everything done. David Dees, who teaches at Texas Tech, um, I was really privileged to work with him um, through a Big 12 um, fellowship and so um, it was kind of an exchange and part of the exchange was this collaboration um, and that was a challenging word to get together but um, but David was outstanding I mean he really went to bat on that piece and it, it came together um, so you know from a logistical standpoint um, including so many people and and a lot of times the composers were there I know Ben Furman 
um, was there for the recording. I believe Matt was there. I, yeah, you were there. Yeah, I was yeah. there. Yeah. Um, um, and, you know, and, and some of them I, I would send, like David Rakowski um, wasn't able to be there, but I would send him um, the raw takes and he'd say, all right, this is great, but you guys got to do this, this, basically, you know, he's very meticulous and okay. Um, so there's collaboration from that standpoint, too. I mean, you know, I think the, the benefit of um, electronic communication certainly helps. And then um, with the performers, just playing with them a lot. I mean, I've played with all these guys um, several times, and so it, it came together pretty well. Well, why don't we uh, give a quick listen, actually, to the title track by Matt, uh, Differential Moods. All right, here it is. This is Differential Moods by our guest Matthew Shandorf, performed by our other guest Jeff Leverett on his new album, Differential Moods. So that was an excerpt from Differential Moods by Matt Shandorf, performed by Jeff Leffert on his new album, Differential Moods. Thank you guys so much for sharing that with us. Um, yeah, Matt, the I, big... I was Sorry, gonna say, go I, just, I just want to say I love that, uh, the, so like, that range in the piano and the left hand is just so perfect, Matt. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Well, two things struck me. I mean, I listened to this like a month ago when I booked you guys on the show, and then I listened to it again this morning, is A, as with any piece by Mr. Shandorf, your, your thought is, man, those are some cool chord changes. <laughs> yeah, that is the chord king. <clears throat> you can take the Jamiroquai out of the boy, but you can't take the Jamiroquai, I mean, the boy out of the Jamiroquai or whatever. Right, right. And, well, and Jeff, the, the, the characteristic of that piece to me from your point of view is like there is no place to hide. So, like, recording it is one thing, but, man, I would be, even though everything we listen to up to that point isn't, finger quotes for people listening, hard, right? It is, if, if you're not just right on, it sounds, you know, it could sound bad if you're not right on. You know what sure. I mean? Well, it's really quite challenging, um, and, you know, because of time, obviously, we weren't able to hear the build. I mean, there's kind of a... Um, a really rock out kind of yeah. fun section, um, but at the end um, it kind of references the beginning, um, and it's an extreme upper range of the saxophone, um, which <laughs> I, made me um, a little bit upset with Matt a couple of times. No, it, it went well. I mean, it's, it, it's it's a it's a great ending, but it's technically um, it's challenging for the saxophone, um, especially after playing for seven minutes. But um, you know, it's it's a it's a great piece. I mean, and I absolutely agree with the chord changes and. Um, I, it's, it's just really well constructed. I mean, it's, it's absolutely Matt style and, um, it's something I really appreciate. I'm very proud to have it on the disc. Matt, absolutely. what, are, Matt, what are some of the considerations you had to make when you were, uh, kind of tra transitioning the, the solo part from being an oboist to a soprano saxophonist? Well, uh, honestly, uh, there weren't a whole, th there weren't very many, uh, specific considerations because uh, when I originally written it for oboe, um, 
You accidentally I, wrote a soprano saxophone piece for oboe. Well, well, yeah, pretty much. So, so it, well, they have really it, similar ranges, right? They, they like, do, yeah, they, they do, and and they uh, it, it the the piece translated really well, and I, I mean, it, it worked. It worked all right for oboe, but there were certain parts, especially in that middle rock out section. Um, oboes have a hard time rocking out, you know. But <laughs> is it oboes <laughs> or is it oboes? Send your hate mail to well, Matt that, Shandorf. Is, well, it, uh, is it oboes <laughs> that can't rock out, or is it oboists that can't rock out? I, 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 I think <laughs> that's that's really where the concern is. Let oh, okay. me all right, send your hate mail to Dave <laughs> McDonald and Matt Shandorf. Well, uh, all right. Let, let me let me put it this way: If you're going to rock out a a soprano sax, um, ha, has a, a more of a natural ability to do that, I think. So Absolutely. the piece, the, the the piece, just I don't know. It, it 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 really does lend itself really well to the soprano sax, um, more so than the original oboe version. Um, so I, th- th- there wasn't really a whole lot that I had to do because pretty much everything that I wanted it to do and that I wanted the soprano sax to do was already kind of in the music. So, it, so it, did you increase the upper range at all? Because that's one big thing I think soprano, I mean, a saxophone would have on an oboe, especially for a quality player, is the top end is more expanded. Well, uh, I, I didn't expand it because originally I wrote it as a super hard piece for oboe. So it originally right. was a pretty expanded range for oboe initially. Um, but... Uh, the soprano sax just, you know, it just kind of yeah. naturally. Well, I mean, as it, an so. undergraduate, I took lessons on saxophone and played out of a oboe book, you know, an oboe mm-hmm. etude book, which Jeff is shaking his head. I'm sure every saxophone player who's been to college <clears throat> has done some of that somewhere because the ranges are really similar. They have the same bottom note. You can't play any lower. That's basically it. And, and, and you know, leaving out the altissimo, the practical range is real similar, too. Is it written bottom note? Yeah, written lowest written bottom note, barring like paper towel rolls or whatever else you might want to stick in there. But but I'm not saying that in a derogatory way. I've heard some great pieces that involve cramming toilet paper rolls and what have you up sax. I mean up uh, clarinet bells. Thank you, Eric Mandad. Well, sometimes you just need that range. You just right. want that sound. So that's right. So uh, Matt, what's yeah. up for you compositionally now? Uh, I know that you're always writing pieces, and you borrowed my uh, uh, Beatles complete score to do some arranging. So I know you're very busy as an arranger and a composer, always writing pieces for young band, also, which is not an easy thing to do. What's been going <laughs> no, it's on? Not. Well, uh, uh, I actually did uh, finish a piece for, well, I wouldn't call it young band, uh, maybe about high school level. Um, it was a, uh, a hymn actually, uh, for a friend of mine in Australia, um, for a competition. Uh, uh, she was looking for, um, uh, apparently they, one of the requirements for their, their competitions, their, their, their band festivals over there is that they have to have a hymn kind of like how here in the States, everybody has to play a March. Right. So there's not a whole lot of, uh, of hymn <laughs> music for band. Um, so I told her, well, I'll write you one. Um, and I kind of. I, I got carried away with a little bit and uh, took some influences from some Elgar and some uh, Lords and some, you know, and uh, it just put together into a hymn for band. Um, and it's had a couple performances already. Um, and if I can uh, ever get through uh, a whole bunch of string quartet arrangements I'm doing right now, uh, I hope to be able to put those materials together and uh, and actually get it published at some point later this year. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I did uh, that band piece earlier this year. Right now, I'm in the middle of doing um, a whole bunch of string quartet arrangements of, uh, of uh, uh, just uh, Mozart, Beethoven, you know, all the all the greats of uh, of of classical, you know, classical Western art music for a wedding that's coming up. Um, and there are about 50 pieces uh, that the guy wanted. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It, I was like, a wedding? What's the big deal? Three or four pieces? Well, uh, 50 well, uh, pieces? Yeah, yeah. Well, he's he is a huge classical music fan, and uh, he wanted all these different pieces at his wedding, um, but they hired all of a string quartet to do it. So I'm taking, I, I'm yeah, I, I'm taking uh, Beethoven symphonies and having to cut them down and reduce them into a, <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it, yeah, nobody in their right mind would ever do this job 
but fortunately I'm not in my right mind. So that's what I've been doing this entire month and I'm still not done yet. So hopefully sometime this week I'll be done with that. Once I'm done with that, um, I'm going to That be does working. sound like a good project to get published, though. I was going to say, that yeah. sounds super marketable. Well, reducing Symphony sounds like you can get that <laughs> published. And it also sounds like grueling composer work. Like, oh, oh, you're, you're earning the, your the paycheck there, my friend. Oh, oh, for sure. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. But it, uh, it, does, uh, it does help me uh, refamiliarize uh, myself with a lot of the standard rep. Um, and it uh, gives me all, all kinds of musical examples that I can use for a, um, for a pre-college theory text that I have to put together this summer for a, uh, uh, for a music theory program that's going to be started at, uh, at Cranbrook Schools in September. That oh. I'm be so, um, yeah, so it, it will have its benefits, but yeah, at the moment I'm basically just yeah, doing some grueling, you know, arranging work. Well, from the, the point of view of... Um, you're doing it and you're making money at it, which is good. But yeah. uh, in the future, when you teach those pieces, think how fluent you're going to be oh, in oh, all absolutely. the pieces you've done arrangements of. Oh, yeah. Because you've basically already done the hard work of breaking it down to only the most important stuff. Mm. Oh, <laughs> so yeah. that, that part of the job is done already. So, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Um, so, Throw Jeff. Throw Dvorak 7 for good measure. There you go. Please. <laughs> Um, so Jeff, uh, obviously you just had the, the solo album released in January and you're always busy with H2. Are you planning any kind of tour or have you already done any kind of tour in support of the solo effort? Well, you know, I, I have performed some, um, with the solo effort, um, you know, Jonathan Nickel and I, who've uh, performed some of the duos on this, this, we've kind of expanded our duo repertoire and had, um, some new works created for us, um, um, and so that's something that we're doing in September. Um, we, we have a really busy summer with H2. Those guys, I'm at Oklahoma State University right now, and they're driving in um, as we speak. We have a rehearsal in about a half hour. Um, <laughs> we're, um, we're recording um, a new CD um, in June. Um, so we'll actually do that in Oklahoma. Um, we'll do this with Blue Griffin Recording. So Sergey uh, Kavitko is coming down from Michigan. Um, He's coming we, there. Yeah, he's coming here, oh, so nice. uh, we'll see how this works. And um, yeah. we have the Oklahoma Saxophone Workshop um, that H2 um, will be hosting um, at, down at the University of Oklahoma. Um, this has been organized by Jonathan Nickel, and will also feature Joe Luloff and John Nickel Sr. and Bill Funky. Um, so it'll be nice. a great saxophone workshop. Um, we have the Cortona sessions for new music. Um, we're pre premiering um, six new quartets, so we have a lot of work to do starting today. Um, Can you throw and, out the composer names on those? Uh, Carolyn O'Brien, um, Antoine Fichard, um, Tina Talon. Um, we're doing a Mark Mellitz. And this, I'm not actually sure that that's a premiere, but it's new to us. Um, and a couple of other works. We're, we're playing a piece by Bill Ryan uh, that we actually premiered very recently that we'll reprise there. Um, um, we'll also perform a work by Matthew Rosenblum, who I think you guys had on the show. I saw. Yeah, yeah. we did. Yeah, and you played right after we had him on the show. You played at the festival in Pittsburgh. Oh, that's right. We did the Andy Warhol to, Museum. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Music on the Edge series. Um, yeah. Well, it, this is an excellent piece, and it. You know, it's kind of been lost in the saxophone repertoire, um, I think in part just because it's so hard, um, not just technically, uh, maybe more so, but the ensemble is so hard. Um, um, and had, you know, if this were in the past where we were really spread out in the four corners of the world, um, it would have been impossible to get together. But being close has afforded us the opportunity to learn new music and to rehearse, which is and uh, for almost listeners a novelty. Who don't know for listeners who don't know, saying that they're playing a piece by Matthew Rosenblum is like is saying means that they're having to learn some form of a microtonal thing going on. I would assume, correct? Oh, there were there were quite a bit. So of course, you know, quarter tones. Um, there are quarter tones that are in unison between like alto and soprano saxophone or tenor <laughs> and alto. Um, so and you're then, both doing this fingering. Yeah, or right. something so, you know. And it's not so and, easy. <laughs> yeah. um, and then uh, a lot of six tones actually. And um, there's an extended passage, six tone in the a baritone saxophone that Kim does really well. Um, and Matt had said, you know, this work was done, um, I, I'm not sure if it was concurrent or right after it was done as a saxophone quartet, but also a saxophone quartet with orchestra. And all the six tones were actually done by a synthesizer, I believe. <laughs> um, and so in the quartet, it's all in the berry, and, and she does great. But um, 
you know, I think it's one of the things we really love about um, working with composers and playing the music to today. It, it really challenges us. And um, I mean, that piece challenged us. It was um, it, it took us some time to get together, but the payoff was extraordinary. And um, we're so glad to have that in the repertoire, but we're going to record this on the new CD as well. Um, so we have some things coming up, um, you know, uh, it's a quartet. It, it's, um, it feels kind of nonstop sometimes, but that's that's what's exciting right. about it. And, um, you know, I, I recently I had to do a count of my activities. It's something we have to report on here. And um, maybe, one maybe of the... just finished the same thing. Yeah, it's, well, you know, yeah. so, it's, so, you know, what I was looking at is in the last six years, um, at the end of this um, summer, I'll have premiered 100 new pieces, and most of them are with a quartet. And um, I'm, I'm really proud of that. And, and, and also, you should be. Absolutely. Um, it's, just, it's just nice to be able to um, champion the music of our time. And, um, and, you know, we have so many close relationships with so many of these composers, and it's, it's really had a profound influence on how we approach music and, and how we think about our performances and what we're trying to get out of this career. Um, so it's, you know, it's something we're really grateful for. Absolutely. Um, and just for anyone out there who's listening who might be scared of the idea of microtonal whatever, um, I don't know what this piece is exactly like, but my experience with Rosenblum's work when we had him on the show is that it really is very approachable, even though, I mean, it's sort of like it's built, or the pieces we listen to are sort of built on, you know, equal temperament, and then the other stuff is thrown in for added variety, and it really works well. We, I heard a band piece. I mean, I listen to a bunch of his stuff on SoundCloud, too, so it's, it's user-friendly microtonal, you might say. Yeah, well, it's super cool, and I mean, he, def he definitely um, kind of has an eclectic musical palette, and um, I don't, you know, I, I remember one of my teachers, Jean-Michel Gouri, always throw the term maximalist, you know, when you think of like maximalist in terms of visual art and how that works in music. And, and I kind of think of Rosenblum's music in much the same way. I mean, you get a lot, um, there's a lot of substance and a very short amount of music. Um, but, um, you know, he, he crosses styles very quickly. It's, it's really great music. I mean, this Mobius Loop, I, I think is one of the best works in our repertoire. Um, and it's a shame that it kind of, um, went um, missing for such a while. It was premiered by the Rasher Quartet, I believe, in 2001, and um, I don't know if another group has played it. Um, maybe, mm. um, um, but hopefully more groups will. It's just a hard piece, um, and so I, I can see, um, you know, where where it's it's a hard piece, not from a technical standpoint for the individual instruments, but um, it really I think requires um, great communication skills in an ensemble. And, um, and we, you know, with H two, we've been playing together for several years, and so now we can tackle this repertoire. Um, and um, you know, we're, we're proud to have this piece in our in our collection now. Nice, Matt. Have you ever considered, or have you ever? I mean, I think the answer, I know the answer, but I'm not certain. Have you ever delved into microtones in a, in a work of yours? Uh, no, I have not. Um, I, I don't know. I, it's, it, it's, it's, the it's devil. an interesting, well, no, it's, an, it's an interesting concept. Well, yeah, it is the devil. Sure. Yeah. It's an interesting concept, but <laughs> it's not, it's not the primary focus of, of what I do. And I think there are so many composers out there who do it, um, a lot better than I probably would. Um, I, You're I, I don't cool consider it... guy. You've got well, that. Well, I, it's, <laughs> I, 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 I suppose. I, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, you know, I, I, I have, I have my own personal strengths and weaknesses as a composer and I don't, I don't think microtones is necessarily one of my strengths. So may, maybe someday I'll get into it. Um, but I have not as of yet. Right. So, <sighs> well, Thank you so much, guys. I think we're going to launch into the news here, and I don't know if you know anything about these, but feel free to pipe in if you have thoughts. Um, first up, we've talked a lot about the San, uh, Opera San Diego, I think is his technical term. Um, San Diego having, Opera. Whatever. San Diego Opera. They've been having, <laughs> they've been having issues, and uh, they weren't certain whether or not they were going to have their next season. Um, but they have come together and basically a bunch of rich donors said, yes, we have to have the next season because it's the 50th season. So San Diego Opera will be having a 50th season, their next coming season. But uh, at the same time when they announced this, and, and I, haven't, I have to admit that I didn't 
realize this story was in the dock and I haven't read it, so somebody might have to take over. The Office of the California Attorney General is launching an audit of San, San Diego Opera after they announced that they would have a next season. <laughs> Please, somebody who read the story, take it from there. Yeah, they. I mean, they, they had the, the reason why they are continuing. Like, they had some financial Somebody stole some money from them or something. Like, it, there, some... there was there was a there's there was some administrative... weird thing that nobody's quite sure what happened to a bunch of money. Oh. There's, um, I don't know if they don't necessarily know what happened, but I there was like financial decisions being made in the from the administration, from the top of the administration, uh, and the board that basically like made it so that you know they felt they had to cancel San Diego Opera and the, any continuing season they wouldn't have enough money, but actually just rejiggering a few things made it more soluble um and so i i believe they ousted somebody um or or there was like a big showdown yeah that was it um in, in the board there was like dozens of board members there i think 20 or 30 had walked out and a number of others stayed in um it was a big issue to like keep this company afloat and they all thought they were just gonna have to bag it but um, fortunately, they came back and said, yes, we can do a 2015 season, which will include La Boheme, Don Giovanni, and Nixon in China. Um, and so it'll nobody's be a very ever gone season. wrong and not sold out a theater play in that stuff. Yes. Nixon in China is solid gold. Anyway. It is um, gold. Right. Um, and La Boheme, I mean, are they going to have yeah. a... Are they going to... Is that... Is there going to be someone without any tears in their eyes? <laughs> Uh, this guy right here, who has two <laughs> thumbs and will not cry one bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, hey, is is that the fat lady singing? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about that for a segue? I don't know. I, I don't know been, either. <laughs> it's been all you over, own it. all over the the quote news in as much as the news that music nerds pay attention to. Um, this is coming on the heels of a couple of months ago, the big kerfuffle over um, idiotic statements made by very prominent composer, I mean, uh, conductors regarding female conductors. Now, uh, there was a story that was uh, originally started because of reviews of the uh, Irish soprano Tara and Dave, I'm sorry. I'm going to go with Tara Erot. That's what I was going to say. E-R-R-A-U-G-H-T. Uh, she's, she's playing in Richard Strauss's uh, Der Rosenkavalier and, uh, as, as a, a pants the, role, so she's playing the role of a young boy, uh, right. which is very common, uh, if you're not familiar, very common in At opera. The Glenbourne Festival. Right. Uh, and uh, a lot wow. of the reviews. And the weird thing to me is that it's more than one review that had this. Yes. There were several despicable. reviews that commented on her appearance, specifically her, and her being overweight. Else. And, and, and nothing else. I wouldn't say nothing else, but focusing on that over her performance. And yeah, since since this has happened, and I was not terribly familiar with this this young woman, she's very young, she's like 27. Uh, yeah. I went and, and found and some, some performances of her on on YouTube. She's phenomenal. She's a fantastic singer. Uh, I can't imagine that her performance in Strauss was anything less than phenomenal. And those reviews that actually did comment on the performance yes. did say that she was great. So um, I, it's and, really it's super weird that this is... So the idea, they, they're commenting on the performance like in terms of voice and um, the, like the character in general. And the conventional... The conventional uh, idea of what that character should be um sure, and so whatever. well i'm just i'm just saying that's what that's uh, who who well, someone yes. responded okay. so who responded um i stand by every word who was that um let me see here here's andrew there were, oh, so a lot of people were saying that they found that her unbelievable in this role because she's overweight uh which is yeah, yeah. which is really strange because you're watching an opera yeah there there are so many unbelievable things that are happening in front of God, you that God is the least that sus suspension of disbelief might be involved right 
Right. Andrew Clark writing for the Financial Times. Tara Arat's Octavian is a chubby bundle of puppy fat. The only thing he says about the performance was that it was gloriously sung. Shouldn't you say that first? And in maybe the Guardian, not the other part at all? Yeah, Andrew Clements in The Guardian. It's hard to imagine this stocky Octavian as this willowy woman's plausible lover. In other words, I can't see her being the lover of this person because of the way she looks. Doesn't say anything about the way she sang. Uh, in Gramophone, which is, you know, a very... Uh, stayed and traditional been around forever publication this octavian has the demeanor of a scullery maid uh and well so and and that's all he says in 250 words without addressing how she sang and over the last few years there has been a lot uh we, we have seen several opera singers in particular but uh classical music performers in general who are very attractive, becoming very famous yes. in a way that we I, I don't think previously saw. We have uh, singers like Anna Netrebko and Jonas Kaufman uh, that that are that are very uh, beautiful people that also happen to sing really well, uh, right. becoming famous. And I don't know if that has caused people to change the way they think about sure opera it theater. But I, I to, well, and also to play devil's advocate a little bit, this is a theatrical work. This is not certainly. simply uh, an an auditory it's not experience a recording. when you go to the opera. It's and, not, and it's not a recording, and it's not even a concert performance. It's an opera. It's a theater performance. And these body people, size. Go ahead, Sam. Body size can be a mitigating factor. Like if the person is gigantic. And it, they just won't work in the role at all. But I'm the the criticism they're giving her. I think you need to look like we're going to have a link to the uh, the uh, Deceptive Cadence blog from NPR that kind of outlines the whole thing and gives quotes from other sources about. That's, and this is a big rant, by the way, that I would highly commend to you by Anastasia Lucius. So yeah, uh, check check it out. She's she's on fire. But what I was going to say is, there's a picture right at the top. You know, it, it, you know. Obviously, she's not a you know beer commercial skinny model. But she's not. We're not talking about a gigantically overweight person. We're talking she's chubby, just a but little bit. But even if dip. she was, who cares? Like we see right. really, really overweight people in opera and in musical <laughs> performance all the time. Well, did you guys Anastasia happen to rants, go I'll- see? any of the the met live in hd when they were doing wagner like these are not this conversation is not be having is, is not being had um in regards About to race men. either yeah well, i mean like no one's bringing up oh i can't imagine this you know black woman with a white man or something yeah. like that like right. no one is saying that of course they wouldn't right well that's nobody that's really- true nobody said eric owens doesn't make sense as albrick because he's black Right, right, right. Like Eric this Owens can sing the, his ass off, and it doesn't matter. This is one of the prejudices that is still just sort of glossed over and accepted, even by like hand wringing liberal college professors. People who are overweight get shamed and 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 discriminated against, and I'll add, people from the South still get the same treatment. It's perfectly acceptable to talk about inbred dumbass Southerners. Even for people who are supposed to be, you know, intelligent, open-minded, liberal people. So that's my that's, that's my one uh, um, editorial comment. I don't know. Do you, anybody else have any thoughts on this one, or have we wrung it dry? We wrung it dry. Everybody was charged up. Yeah. It seems yeah. very so especially especially Norman Lebrecht was. Yeah. Well, right. I, well, let's not get into him. He's a bit of a hypocrite. We, we try subject. to have his stuff on the show as infrequently. <laughs> He's a hypocrite on the subject. You can find his reviews that yeah. comment on it. He just yes. thought this was his turn to flip and play the other side because it would make him popular. Matt, what yes. were you, you going to say, Matt? I, I, the whole thing seems really TMZ for music criticism. It's just, yes. yeah. I mean, come on. Come well, on. Well, here's the key quote that uh, from, uh, I can't remember who the quote was from, but I put the quote out there to the panel this morning in getting ready for the show. It was, in, it was from Anastasia's piece. Right. Uh, 
maybe it makes me wonder if classical music doesn't deserve its stereotype of being silly, reactionary, outdated, and out of step with contemporary the contemporary world. And I mean, as far as like the majority of classical music writ large, I think it absolutely is. Sure. And and the thing Matt said about uh, music criticism and and how, how this is a lot like TMZ, this is exactly the sort of thing you would get from pop music criticism. And, mm-hmm. and we just talked uh, on the show about a month ago about a, a, a round of editorials about the state of pop music criticism and how it has turned into basically lifestyle reporting and yes. is, is not even talking about music anymore anyway. So uh, that's I well. Think, a lot of pop music is more commerce than music anyway. So, I mean, sure. if you look Absolutely. at the, the top 40, that's that's kind of what it is. So, Right. And lastly, speaking of being fired up about topics, I've had to promise Dave we'd get through this real fast. I didn't um, we've say talked, that. You can say, we've, take we've your time. Talk, okay, we've talked about uh, on the show, and we've actually published some stories regarding this topic on our uh, Tumblr, Tumblr blog. Yep, Tumblr, uh, Sound Notion B-side, um, uh, regarding net neutrality. I don't want to get off on a tirade or a rant, although this is a subject that I, deser- that I think deserves ranting and tirading. Um, the FCC voted recently uh, they were going to um, make changes to the way the FCC regulates broadband internet, um, but instead they decided to open it to public uh, comment, which is kind of the way the FCC does business. Um, does that one option. Anything? What's that? Like, if they open it up for public comment, is that going to change anything? Um, Nobody it can, does. Absolutely. I'm going to have links to how to comment. Trust me in the in the show notes. Um, one option favored by the FCC chairman Tom Wheeler, and this is a, a very important, would permit quote fast lanes on the internet if they are <laughs> quote commercially feasible, whatever the hell that means. What that means is internet service providers are going to be able to have premium data channels and less than premium data channels. And remember, as uh, we would have learned by reading 1984, all data is equal, except some data is more equal than others, right? Hmm. I mean, this is serious stuff. Uh, I the believe other that was option- Animal Farm, actually. Yeah. But whatever. anyway, anyway. <laughs> the other option favored by many uh, network neutrality advocates would um, have the FCC ban paid prioritization. That's what we want. And it's important for, as an example, Sound Notion is a very niche market. And But to people who are really into new music, we might be considered a pretty valuable commodity. Um, but culture at large wouldn't consider us thus. So it could be the prerogative of an internet service provider to bottleneck our ability to spread the sound notion gospel, if you will. And we don't want that to happen. Um, Later this year, the FCC will choose between uh, two different approaches. They're either going to uh, make laws governing how um, internet service providers can basically monetize access by choking down certain uh, uh, d- uh, data streams and making uh, paid prioritization uh, a matter of fact. Or, and this is what we really want, we want broadband to be uh, categorized as a, what is it, Dave? A Title II act- common carrier. A title, yeah, Title II common carrier, like phone service. So it's considered something that is provided by someone who's in the business for money, but it is highly regulated by the government. They're a utility. Because basically. they are a utility. And anyone who doesn't agree that the internet and access to it is a utility needs to rethink their position. Well, they're it's, currently classified as information providers, which is includes the extra services they have like email cuz you know everybody uses their ISP provided email addresses. Yeah. But that's that's why they're classified that way. That's how they got classified that way in the first place. Um, yes. cuz they didn't want to be classified as common carriers. But uh one of the tricky things about talking about this is that um it's very the the way the internet works is crazy. Just try reading the Wikipedia article about how the internet works and it's mm-hmm. kind of mind-blowing that it even does work. Uh, If you can even understand half of it, you're doing better than me. Uh, And so we can really, since none of us 
have 15 years experience as network systems administrators, uh, we can really only ever talk about it in terms of analogies, which is really hard to do and come up with a, a workable yes. analogy because there's not there's nothing that works the way that bits do exactly and there's nothing that works the way the internet does exactly and so we kind of just oh, use except for maybe maybe a series of tubes you know well so, tubes, yeah. honestly <laughs> honestly some of the best uh metaphors about this problem have been framed as a series of tubes yeah so. they really are i mean the people gets made fun of a lot but um, and, and the reason why it's very important is because um, it doesn't mean that if we screw up the way the FCC handles Internet coverage now, it can't be fixed. But if we don't make our voice heard and have it be characterized as a utility and they go into this basically uh, priority for pay system, it can be fixed, but it will take a long time and a lot of very hard work to fix it. And we'll end up being stuck in a very bad system for a long time. So care about this now so that you don't have to care about it later was what I'd say. Right. And we'll have links about how to um, comment, quote, publicly comment on the FCC's this upcoming decision in the show notes. Right. We'll have there. that in the show notes. Uh, and it looks like we lost Matt temporarily, but that's okay uh, because we're wrapping up. We will have all the information about the FCC in the show notes. You should uh, you know, follow what's going on with that because it is very important to the way the Internet will work going forward and the way people will be able to innovate on the Internet uh, going forward, not just in the United States, but in the rest of the world because uh, the United States is a very large market and uh, products even from outside the United States often have to travel through the United States pipes to get to where they're going. So... Uh, it looks like Jeff has some 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 visitors nearby, but, so we're gonna wrap up. Uh, ah, did they show up for rehearsal? Yeah, they're they're all here. They're looking at me through the window of my office door. Uh, come on, let's get nice. them all on camera to say goodbye. I don't think they're here, but it'd be good to get them here. <laughs> yeah, I think they're upstairs. But... That's all right. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Jeff and Matt. It's been great talking to you. We'll. Uh, you have last chance to plug anything you have coming up, shows or or anything like that. Um, I don't want to plug anything. I, I just want to thank you guys for doing such a great job with this show. It's really wonderful. And, um, you know, I have relationships with you guys on a personal level and, um, you know, as students and um, really, really grateful for you guys. So thanks for, for everything. Thank you. Thanks. That thank means you. A lot, man. Uh, uh, this show and all our shows, you'll find the show notes, all the stories that we talked about on our site, soundnotion.tv slash SN. You'll also find links to differential moods you can you can listen to the music and you should absolutely listen to the rest of the piece there's a, a lot of uh significant changes that happen throughout differential moods uh the differential part i suppose um and uh so we could we only played about a minute and a half of it but it's about an eight and a half or so minute piece uh, and it's great you should check it out and you should check out the rest of the the record as well we'll have links to where you can do that uh on on bandcamp jeff can people stream the whole album on bandcamp or just parts of it i i think just parts of it um so yeah just parts of it on bandcamp but uh the album's available on um amazon and a lot of online um places so all right excellent so definitely check that out. Buy the whole thing, it's, it, and, it's, and you'll be very happy with it. Um, you can connect with us on Facebook or Twitter or uh, or YouTube or now on our Tumblr blog where we will post things that don't fit onto the show, that don't quite uh, fit in with uh, the, the, the scope of the show or we don't have time for or that we just think are interesting and, and, and that our audience might be interested in. And that's at blog.soundnotion.tv. Uh, for you can do that. You can uh, so you can subscribe to this show and all our shows uh, in the iTunes podcast store or wherever finer podcasts are aggregated. If you want to support our show, you can go to the iTunes store and leave us a good review there. Uh, if you don't like our show, I don't know why you've listened to it this long, but you could, I suppose, leave a not positive <laughs> review as well. Um, but it, it helps us get found in the iTunes store when we have those reviews. You can also support us using the uh, Amazon affiliate links on our site. When you buy your stuff on Amazon, you use the little search box to find it, and we get a little commission for sending you there. So thank you so much for, for those of you that have done that. We stream the show live on Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Eastern Time at live.soundnotion.tv. And, of course, all our shows are available for download or streaming on demand uh, later. So 
Uh, thank you guys again so much for being with us this morning. Sound Notions introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lapp. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you back next week. Cat videos. <laughs>